Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see there are all kinds of questions uh, stored up here, sent in. Um, all right, let's see, where should we start? Let's start with one from Erin here. Can you explain rasterization? Does the human visual system use a molecular scale version of rasterization? Okay, well, let's talk about representing pictures on computers and elsewhere. So there are two fundamental ways that computers tend to represent images, so-called bitmap graphics and vector graphics. So let me try to explain that, what, what that's about. So one thing you can do, like on your computer screen, your computer screen consists of an array of millions of pixels, millions of individual places where there's a red, green, and blue uh, dot, basically. They're usually rectangular, actually. If you look at them on a magnifying glass, or these days almost a microscope, you can see they're usually these little rectangular uh, regions that light up where, where in each little, little place on the screen, there's a little region that lights up red, a region that lights up green, a region that lights up blue. Those make primary colors and that um, and uh, where in places where your screen looks white, all three of those are lit up. Um, so one way to represent an image is just to decide which of those pixels you'll light up on a screen. Um, and uh, that, um, uh, that's a so-called bitmap image. The reason it's called a, a bitmap image is because in the past, people would say, let's construct what uh, let, let's, let's say, what are we going to display on a computer screen? Um, they would assemble that in the memory of the computer. So in the memory of the computer, there'll be a bunch of memory locations and they're kind of laid out linearly actually, but, but um, uh, and, and what one's saying is in the memory of the computer, say this, this place is gonna be a one, let's say black, another place is gonna be zero, it's white, let's say, and you're gonna lay them out in a, in a sort of map in the memory of the computer, and then you're going to, uh, it's kind of an abuse of, of names, but in the end, you're going to have um, uh, this, these bits on the screen are going to be laid out in this map in memory. And there are things like um, uh, bit blitting, which was some um, uh, kind of an operation where you would do things where you are in the memory of the computer, you are combining, let's say, two different pieces of image in a certain way, which will then be bitmapped, is the usual terminology, onto the screen. So there's a place in computer memory, and then that's what that what you see on the screen is kind of a mirror of what's in computer memory. And, that, and that's still the way things tend to work in computers at a very low level, but that's not something you typically have to know about in using a computer. But so one way of representing an image is as a bitmap. That is something where you've turned the image into a whole bunch of of, of little, little square pixels and each for each pixel, you say what its color is. That's way number one. Way number two is so-called vector graphics where, um, or what one might call symbolic graphics, that will be the kind of the term in, in more in, in Wolfram language. Um, where what you do is you say, there's a line from this coordinate position to that coordinate position. There's a circle, there's a, there's this thing, there's that thing, there are these, objects that you can describe in a sense geometrically, um, which go across many different pixels on the screen, um, but uh, they are, um, they're described in geometrical terms. Okay, so in the history of these things, a place where it was really important to describe things or really useful to describe things geometrically was in fonts. So if you have a letter A, for example, you can imagine drawing that letter A, if you draw it very small, you wouldn't notice that you, all you're determining in the, in the letter A is which pixels were, were black in the letter A. But if you blow that letter A up and you make it a 100 point font, one, one point is one, uh, well, it's a little bit complicated, but in, when it's printed, a so-called printer's point is 1 72nd of an inch. Um, so a, when you say, a font size such and such. Let's say you say 12 point font. What that means is that um, the, I guess it's the X height, the height of a lowercase X is equal to 12 printer's points 
or 12 70 seconds of an inch. Um, and so when, when, you know, when you say 36 point type, that's pretty big headline type type, that means 36 point type is half an inch high. That means that the X in that font is half an inch high. It's, it's a rather confusing thing. In fonts, there are measurements that are based on uh, actual letters of the, of the English alphabet. So for example, when you measure spacing, you'll, you'll often call it, say it's in terms of M's usually spelled E-M, and that is literally the width of the character, the M character in that font. And obviously different fonts have different, uh, the, the letters are different widths and so on. And just to say something about fonts, the, uh, there are really uh, several attributes of fonts that are very, very clear. One of them is uh, serif versus sans serif. That is when you have a letter like a, an I, for example, do, is the I just a vertical bar or does the eye have these things at the top, which are sort of horizontal pieces that come out that are kind of, um, well, so-called serifs, they're things that stick out of the letters. Originally, if you go back and you look at, you know, inscriptions in ancient Rome, for example, you'll find a lot of serif letters. That was a convenient thing for stonemasons when they were carving out these letters on, on pieces of stone, that was a convenient, elegant thing for them to do. It's actually remarkable to me when you look at those inscriptions from ancient Rome, how similar the kind of the forms of letters look to the forms that we use today. So over more than 2000 years, the forms of letters haven't changed very much. In, uh, it, was a, it was a much more recent thing of like a hundred years ago, uh, at a time when a lot of kind of design uh, sensibility went from being uh, rather sort of classical and with lots of curves and, and detail and, and so on to more so-called modern, which was more sort of geometrical, you know, kind of uh, structures that were houses that were kind of like just boxes rather than having all kinds of elaborate moldings and, and um, uh, elaborate kind of decoration on them. That was a, a thing of a, a bit more than 100 years ago. And at that same time, also people were, started being interested in fonts that were sans serif, sans meaning French with, without uh, serifs. Um, so fonts where the letter I would just be this vertical thing without sort of things hanging out at the, at the top and bottom. And, and usually uh, there are different purposes for which people use. I mean, sans serif fonts are often used for headings. Um, and sometimes used for captions and, and images and so on. Serif fonts tend to be used for more kind of main text of things. There are a bunch of uh, pieces of evidence that the human visual system finds it easier to read things. When you're reading kind of narrative text, it finds it easier to read when it has kind of a clue of these extra serifs. And maybe sans serif is better for just the, the few characters that you might see in a caption or, or something like this. Um, and uh, so th that's, that's one sort of attribute of fonts is the serifs versus no serifs. Um, another attribute of fonts is uh, monospaced or proportionally spaced. What does that mean? When people had typewriters, um, any character, any letter, um, an, an L, for example, is a pretty narrow letter, lowercase L or lowercase I, those are um, sort of naturally rather narrow letters. But a lowercase m, for example, is a big, long letter. Um, and so, but a typewriter, it just used a fixed amount of space for each letter. So it, it had a, a um, monospaced, single spacing uh, kind of uh, way of doing things. So when you make a monospaced font, um, you have to, every letter has to have a certain form in that font. And so, for example, a letter I, you tend to have to have these great big serifs, you know, an I is just this vertical piece, and then the, these great big horizontal pieces at the top and bottom to kind of widen out the I so it doesn't, so it looks okay, um, even though the font is monospaced, is, is everything is equally spaced. Proportionally spaced is kind of the, the, the case where, uh, where the letter I is very narrow. And, and uh, usually it's, it's more elegant to read a proportionally spaced, um, uh, kind of font and uh, monospaced is, is sometimes, well, it's, it's the old fashioned typewriter form. It's also early computer displays uh, were all kind of monospaced fonts. And sometimes when it's like, oh, I want it to look like computer input or output, one uses kind of a monospaced font for that. Um, the thing that, uh, and that, that, there are many things in, um, uh, in uh, uh, by the way, I should say that when people 
were making, were doing early movable type. So, I mean, back in, in uh, when was it, the 1400s or something, am I right? 1400s, 1400s. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the big invention in terms of printing presses was this idea that instead of just having something where you would, if you wanted to print something like you do with, you know, potato prints or something, you carve out the pattern on the potato, you stick it in some ink and you put it on a piece of paper. That's a way of, you know, given a particular sort of carving, you will, um, uh, you'll always print the same thing. Or for example, if you had uh, uh, some seal um, that was going to be a thing where you would make, you know, an impression with the, with you know, the the seal that was on the ring on your finger or something that would be the thing that says yes, it's me signing my name, and that was something people could do um, even before there was widespread literacy, even before you know the 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 kings and queens of of ancient times or something, uh, even though they couldn't read, you know, they couldn't read and write. Uh, that was delegated to other people, just as often people delegate programming to other people today. Um, but uh, uh, you know, those days, what would often happen is they would have this this ring on their finger, which would have some particular design on it, and they would uh, indicate yes, you know, they really agreed with some some big document that was put in front of them by pressing that ring into a piece of hot wax that would keep the impression of whatever it was on on that ring, and you kind of knew, you know the queen did it herself type thing because um, it was, uh, because, you know, that ring is, is only to be found on her finger, so to speak. Um, so in any case, the, the, uh, the sort of the big idea of early printing was, was the idea of, of type that wasn't just a fixed thing that you carved out. It was something where you would just have a lot of little pieces of, of individual letters, usually made of lead, um, because that was a convenient soft metal. And so like when I was a kid, for example, I used to use these things, um, you would have, uh, you know, a case of letters, you would have the lower case, and you would have the upper case, and they would be, um, the case of letters would be this, this wooden box with uh, a bunch of E's, a bunch of T's, a bunch of W's, a bunch of Z's. And they always have little, those little, the, the, the little areas for the different letters would always be different sizes. So like there'd be more E's and T's than there were W's and Z's, just because in a typical thing that you're going to typeset, there would be more copies of, there would be more words that have E's in them than have Z's in them. So anyway, you you do this and, and the way it worked was you would, uh, you would have a, a metal, thing that you made the type in, you put each letter and you put it actually in upside down. And then to make spacing to the next row of letters beneath it, you would put in a little piece of lead. Um, and that's where the term leading that uh, you see in, in modern, uh, you know, font layout and modern kind of layouts, leading is the amount of lead, literally little pieces of lead that you would put in between one row of type and the next row of type. So that was kind of the approach to sort of typesetting was you pick the individual letters out of the, the upper or lower case of letters and you put them in this thing that you were forming to make this uh, letter press. Um, you, you just make this, uh, this thing and, and when you were finished typesetting that particular page, you would uh, break apart all the type and put all the letters back in their, in their appropriate places and then you reuse them again for the next page you wanted to, to typeset. So by the way, just in sort of the history of typesetting, just to, to fill that in, just uh, people find that interesting, the, the big thing that was invented was photolithography. So the idea was that instead of having a, um, uh, instead of, individually taking those letters made of lead and by hand sort of putting each letter after another one, what you would do is essentially have a photographic image of the page that you wanted to produce. And then you would use that photographic image to etch away a plate um, that was a metal plate and you would etch it away in such a way that the places where, for example, there was white on the, um, uh, on the original photographic image would be etched away and the places where they were black would be still sort of sticking out. And then in order to print something, a bit like potato prints or something, you take that plate and you would put it, uh, you'd have a typically a roller that put ink on it. And then you would take that plate, you put a sheet of paper next to it, and then you've got it printed. And so this idea of taking a photographic image and etching away a plate. So how did the actual etching work? 
uh, how does it work today? Um, uh, I think what happens is very similar to the way that a microprocessor chip is made. That is, you have this, this plate is made of metal, and I, I think you use some uh, uh, use something where the, the material is light sensitive, I think with ultraviolet light, and where ultraviolet light has fallen on this piece of metal, it can be etched away with acid, and where, where it hasn't fallen, it can't be etched away. And so where it hasn't fallen, you'll have kind of a mountain there, and that's the thing that will get the black ink on it or whatever, um, and that's, that's how you'd end up printing, that, that's how you print that piece. And so that's, that's the typical way that printing is done. Now, now the way when printing is done, um, it's a little bit like the way it works on your screen in the sense that you'll have red, green, blue, except that for printing, so the primary colors for light are red, green, blue, the primary colors for printing. So for, for, for light, what, what is relevant is the emission of light and that we, our eyes are sensitive to combinations of red, green, and blue, uh, for determining what we perceive as color. But when you are dealing with something printed, what matters is what light is absorbed by the page. And so what you want are the complementary colors to red, green, and blue, which are cyan, magenta, and yellow. And so when you print things, um, you are using little dots of ink that are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, so it's CMYK is the usual sort of system for color that's used for printing. And if you look under magnifying glass, you'll find um, uh, that uh, essentially any printed page, uh, color printed page, will have these little rosettes of colors. And what's happened is that uh, it's, it's kind of like the screen of your computer. The screen of your computer has arranged red, green, blue dots all in a rectangular array. In, in the case of printing, it's again, the yellow, cyan, magenta, yellow, black are all dots, but there's sort of a trick that's used. Instead of, instead of arranging those dots all in a kind of regular grid, the dots for different colors are arranged in grids at different angles. And the reason that's done is to prevent places where sort of all the dots would line up and you'd see some weird line and you, you'd perceive a weird line, even though you can't see the individual dots when you have enough of them lined up you would generate a line on the page. Um, and so typically those are, I think, I um, uh, forget the angles, but there are, there are angles that, that have the property that they don't end up, they're, 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 they're sort of irregular kinds of numbers that end up not sort of lining up in such a way that lots of dots end up on top of each other. But so that's what you'll see in, in sort of four color printing, so-called four color printing. I mean, just to, to say something else about that technology, when um, uh, usually sort of generic, it's a picture in color, it will be printed in four colors, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, and, and that's done with, a, with an actual printing press. It's done by having four separate passes um, where for each color, uh, you know, where you, first of all, you have a plate that is the yellow plate, the, the, I, I don't know what order it's done in, but, but you know, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, um, and those are separate plates and separate passes in the printing process. But you can also add extra colors. So let's say that you have a, you're trying to make this dramatic brochure or something, and your company's color is purple, um, and you really want a big solid blob of purple in your brochure, um, then you can add what's, I think, in the printing industry called a spot color, where you are adding a kind of, in addition to the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, you'll have um, an additional uh, place where there's a whole um, printing, a whole piece of the printing process that's just using um, a, a purple ink, for example. And so it, it's pretty common to have six color printing where you have two additional colors that are used for kind of your, your sort of highlight colors of something where the, that particular color is going to be used a lot in a particular book or whatever else. So, okay, back to, back to how, um, uh, I was talking about how fonts are made. And so one of the questions is, when you form, if you have a letter A, for example, you want to expand it, you want to make it 72 point type. So it's a, you know, an inch high type thing. Um, the, uh, you're going to want it to be the case that, that you have sort of the same specification of the A. And as you make it bigger and bigger, it doesn't look, it, it doesn't look bad. It still looks good. By the way, I should just a slightly technical point. 
the this thing where I said a printer's point is one seventy second of an inch, and you can measure twelve point type, blah blah blah. Um, needless to say, in the actual development of technology, things got more complicated than that um, because people decided that screens, what they thought was a 12 point font when it was printed should look a little different on the screen. And so, uh, well, Mac and Windows have different conventions for how big an actual point is, an actual printer's point, an actual 172nd of an inch when it was printed, how big that should appear on the screen. And boy, is that a mess. I mean, we're still cleaning up that mess in Wolfram language today you know, decades after that mess was originally created. And, and that means that things, when you have something which looks a particular way on the screen, and then you print it, pretty much every word processor has cheats in it that say, well, make it 80% of the size when you actually print it. And that sort of messes around with what it really means to be a 12 point font and things like that. And what a single printer's point, what the actual size of that is on a screen and, and whether if you measured it with a ruler, it would be that size and usually it wouldn't because of, because of these various cheats that are put in to make it visually appropriate because something that looks the right size on the screen, if you printed it, it sort of puts the same size would look too big on a piece of paper and so on. Okay, anyway, back to fonts. So one of the issues is when you, you have a letter A or something like that, you, you, know, you make it in like 12 point font if you look on your computer screen, you'll see that it's just made of pixels. It's, it's got all these jagged edges. But if you want to take that same sort of specification of the shape of an A and blow it up really big, you don't want to see jagged edges there. You want to see nice, smooth curves. So one of the big innovations, uh, which is actually sort of a key innovation of PostScript, the PostScript page description language uh, that was in the early 1980s, I guess, this happened. Um, the um, uh, was this idea of describing uh, fonts. I mean, this is actually preceded PostScript, but that was the place where it really got kind of uh, um, uh, you know, widely used um, uh, to describe fonts by kind of smooth curves. So you say, oh, this letter O, for example, it's got an actual circle in it. Um, it's not just, oh, the pixels are placed here and here and here. It's the thing is specified by two concentric circles, let's say, for letter O. And, and so that's what a typical vector graphics approach would be, is to say, you'll specify it by those geometric primitives rather than specifying it by where the pixels are. When it's finally rendered on a screen, it's going to be converted from vector graphics to bitmap graphics to actually display on the screen. And so in the case of, of fonts, um, the, uh, the typical way that they're represented. So the question is, what kind of curves do you need to make a letter A? And um, uh, back in the day, oh, people, um, oh gosh, famous font person. Oh my gosh. Um, there's a famous book called, oh, Dura, Albert Dura, wrote a book on the, on, the, on the just formation of letters or something. So a famous artist and um, uh, described kind of, how you make a letter, like a letter A, O, is it really a circle? A letter whatever, is it, you know, what are those curves? Okay, so the big, the big sort of trick of making these fonts is it turns out you can use cubic curves. So for example, a, um, a circle is an example of a curve that mathematically is the curve that is x squared plus y squared equals one, let's say, that makes a circle. If you start talking about curves with cubes instead of squares in them, you get a slightly a bigger range of different possible curves. They can wiggle in different ways. Um, it turns out that using just cubic curves is sufficient to make things that look to us like, oh, that's a nice curve appropriate for a letter. So the, 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 essentially all the letters formed in all the fonts are made from, uh, well, sometimes called cubic splines, sometimes so-called Bezier curves, um, these are very similar kinds of things um, that are what's used to define these kinds of curves. Now, the way those get defined is they, they you can typically have what you, you have is when you have a straight line, you just define a line by two points. It's the, you know, you just join those, you, you take a piece of string, you pull it at the two ends, it'll make a line, the shortest path between two points is a line. Okay, you can make a Bezier curve by saying that in addition to saying that the curve has to go through certain points, 
you also define that the slope of the curve has to be this or that at this or that point, and that the curve has to smoothly interpolate, smoothly go from one point to one uh, slope to another and so on. And so that's, you'll see in, in illustration programs, things like that, you'll sometimes see that you can have, you know, these control points and you're, you're defining curves you're defining essentially not only what, which points the, the, the curve goes through, but also what its slope is. And that's sufficient to define these cubic curves that I've been mentioning. And that's sufficient to draw out the shapes of what end up in fonts. And so, so that's any, any font consists of a bunch of vector specifications of, you know, you draw it with this curve, you draw it with this circle, you draw it with a straight line. That's what a font is. Now, there's a little bit of cheating that goes on, so-called hints in fonts, which is if you're going to really show that font as just a few pixels, and that was more important probably in the past when computer displays were less high resolution than they are today. If you're really going to go down to just a few pixels, well, do you pick that pixel or this pixel? When you're, when you're drawing this line, you know, if you draw a line, let's say at 45 degrees on a computer screen, you might say, pick a pixel. Then go sort of, you know, if you're, if you're thinking of these pixels in a grid, you pick a pixel, you pick a pixel to, that's to the, you know, um, uh, north, northeast of that one, then to the northeast and so on in a diagonal. And there's, but if you, that, that's fairly straightforward to see which pixels you pick. But if you change the angle of that line, it becomes more complicated to see exactly which pixels you pick, because you might, you always have to go up by, by a, a sort of a jump of one pixel. Um, and so you might be, you know, if the line is, is less, uh, less, but, you know, less highly sloped, you would want to go, oh, let's go along for three pixels, then up one pixel, go along for two pixels, up one pixel, and so on. You have to kind of pick exactly how to do that. And that, that's a key piece of, of, for example, this process of rasterization. That's a key thing that you have to do in, um, uh, in sort of uh, drawing a line on a computer display is one of the sort of, the, the, the sort of core things you have to understand how to do to convert from vector graphics to bitmap graphics. So actually I could kind of describe a typical algorithm that's used um, to, to uh, so one thing you can do is you can say, well, uh, what is, how do you define a slope? You say for such and such a distance that you go along in the sort of X direction, you're gonna go up a certain amount in the Y direction. And so let's say it's, it's you're going up um, uh, M times in the Y direction, what you go along in the X direction. Well, then what you would do is, uh, a typical algorithm says you go along in the x direction and you're sort of accumulating how much uh, y motion should you get. So let's say it's, it's m times the distance in x. And every time that m times the distance in x becomes bigger than one um, relative to, you know, you, you're restarting it again. Every time it comes bigger than one, then you go up one pixel and otherwise you're going sort of horizontally on the screen. And that, that's an algorithm for drawing a line at any angle on a, on a computer screen. Okay, so anyway, you, you, you know, when you actually draw fonts, you end up with these, these hints for drawing very small fonts. Um, now, where was I? How, was I, how did I even get to this? I was talking about, um, but that's, that's one of the characteristic things, reasons for which you want to use vector graphics is is to be able to deal with fonts so you can have a, a, the same description of the A at a 12 point font or in a 72 point font font. It's just the same font specification. It's just magnified in one case relative to the other. So that's kind of the, the way that displays get, get produced there. Now things get, uh, there are many, many complexities to all of this. Uh, for example, let's say you have, you're printing on a page, black and white and you want to print a gray scale, you want to print something gray, how do you do it? Well, the answer is you have to make it out of dots and you'll typically, uh, well, printing is, and, and screens are a little bit different. In printing, what you can do is you can just have the dots get progressively bigger. So eventually the dots will all run into each other and it'll be pure black. And if the, if the thing is supposed to be very white, the dots will be you know, very small. And you can represent different gray scales by just having a different size of dots. So you might have an array of dots and the dots will be, each dot will be a different printed size. On a computer display, you don't get to do that because all the dots are the same size. And so you have to do a process that's called dithering. Um, and in dithering, what you do is you say, 
well, which pixels should you turn on to get this gray level? So for example, let's say you want half 50% gray, then what you might do there is just to turn on every other pixel. So you essentially get a checkerboard. Now you ask the question, if you want to get a gray level of, I don't know, 0.37 or something, exactly which pixels do you turn on to get that? You have to be a little bit careful because if you turn on pixels in, uh, with, in, in the wrong kind of way, you'll end up seeing visually this kind of large scale structure in what was supposed to be gray. You'll see these big waves of, oh, it was a bit blacker in this area, a bit whiter in this area and so on. And so it's kind of, an, a, a, there are a bunch of algorithms to decide to do that. Now, when you've got something like a photograph, it's gray level is continuously varying and you have to decide how do you switch on the pixels to determine um, uh, what, um, uh, if it's just black and white, how, which pixels do you switch on? And there's an algorithm that's a little bit like that line drawing algorithm that I mentioned earlier. Basically what you do is you say, you scan the picture, just from, you scan one line of the picture, then the next line, the next line, the next line. And what you do is you are, as, as you scan it, you are, uh, let's see, you're continuously looking at sort of the accumulated gray level. And you're saying every time the accumulated gray level is greater than some value, emit a black pixel. And that's sort of how you're determining how to put, um, uh, how to put black into, into the picture. And, and by the way, you see various kinds of weird little artifacts of this dithering process. If you look in detail at pictures um, uh, uh, rendered on a, on a computer screen and, and, for example, grayscale pictures rendered in black and white. And, and there's a similar approach, by the way, that's used for color, um, same, same kind of idea of, of taking, you know, a continuous variation of color and then rendering it. Um, so, for example, if you take a picture, an image, and you rescale the image, there's a question of how do you determine um, if the image had, a, a, at some large scale, had a thousand pixels across, but you're going to put it into a hundred pixel sized region. Um, how do you decide what, um, which pixels to turn on, which pixels to make, uh, which color, and so on? Uh, how does that work? And it's a little bit easier on computer screens these days because you end up uh, with printing. There's either a dot of ink there, or there isn't a dot of ink, or that might be a different size of dot of ink, and so on. But on computer screens, you can usually change the intensity of the red, green, and blue, as well as deciding is it is it on or off. So anyway, that was a, a little bit of an introduction to um, uh, um, vector graphics versus bitmap graphics. Rasterization is this process of going from the sort of description in terms of symbolic graphics primitives to this uh, array of pixels, this rasterized bitmap form. Um, the, the thing that gets more complicated is when you're doing 3D graphics, and you have to decide. So in, in 3D graphics, the big issue is hidden surface elimination. So if you've got an object and let's say it's a, I don't know, a sphere or something like this, um, the, you know, the sphere, you look at a sphere, well, it's got the front face of the sphere or, or a cube, let's say. You've got the front face of the cube and you've got the back face of the cube. But when you look at a physical material cube, then you don't see the back face when you look at it from one side. And so, but in the computer graphics representation, it's like, well, you've got this geometry that represents the front of the cube, you've got the geometry that represents the back of the cube. How do you make that sort of physical thing of you can see the front, but not the back of the cube? And so a, a common algorithm that was used is sort of a bitmappy type algorithm, it's called Z-buffer, where basically what happens is you say, well, let's first of all, you, you imagine how would you project that, that three-dimensional cube, the geometry of the three-dimensional cube into a two-dimensional plane? And so that involves perspective transformations and things like that. But basically you can know where every piece of that, if you were drawing that 3D cube, where would you put the, you know, where would you draw with your pencil to represent each piece of the cube? So you know where it is in the two dimensional plane. And then you simply ask, well, how deep that, that piece of cube that ends up at this position on your screen, how deep would that be was that on the cube? That's the Z value of, of where it was on the cube. And, and you simply start from the back, you start from the things which were furthest away, um, and you simply start drawing things, uh, starting from the, the ones furthest away to the ones closest. And so the ones that are closer will overwrite the ones that are further away. And so you'll see just the front face of the cube and not the back face of the cube. So that's sort of the simplest approach to hidden surface elimination um, and, and it's one that's used in many places. 
The, the disadvantage of that approach is that it's resolution dependent. So if you, th this question about what's seen, what's not seen, you just are looking at every pixel and you're saying, is that pixel one that will be seen or not seen? But so sometimes what you want to do, and in fact, this is something we kind of uh, did very early in, in the first versions of mathematical and morphine language back in 1987, 1988, um, is resolution independent hidden surface elimination in which what you're doing is you're saying, well, here's this geometry, here's this triangle, for example. Typically surfaces are broken down into triangles, um, little tiny triangles. And you're asking, given this set of triangles, which triangle will be in front of which other triangle? And it's a messy, complicated piece of math and geometry to figure that out. But when you think of one triangle in front of another triangle, it's kind of going to obscure a part of the triangle. It's going to break the other triangle into little shards of smaller triangles and so on. And that's what you have to figure out to do resolution independent hidden surface elimination, which is something that, that we've done for a long time in, in Wolfram language. All right, that was a long answer. To um, I think there was a question. Part of the question here had to do with human visual perception and um, the fact that you know our retinas. If you look at our retina, our retinas cells on the back of our eye that sense light, you'll find that they're arranged in a hexagonal pattern. That's kind of just because there are sort of more or less circular kinds of, of photoreceptors. Uh, and if you just smoosh them all together, it's like you have a bunch of coins and you smoosh them all together and they'll arrange themselves to be in a hexagonal kind of beehive shape uh, type uh, arrangement. And that's why the, the cones, are, the, the, the photoreceptors on, on the back of our eyes are also arranged more or less that way. And so uh, we sort of start off with, um, uh, with this array of pixels, um, but very quickly in our visual system, we're kind of, uh, there are cross connections and things that make our perception uh, not be in this kind of pixelated form. Now, if you're a, uh, if you're a, a house, a fly or a bee or an insect of some kind, uh, your eyes work differently than ours. But sort of the original innovation of the trilobites back in the Cambrian period, um, you know, 100 million, whatever it was, 200 million years ago, um, that their big innovation was, was eyes. And if you look at a fossil, I have one on my shelf here, actually, um, a fossil of a, of a trilobite, you look at its eyes, there are a bunch of hexagonal pieces in the eyes. Those are what exist even in modern insects and so on. Those are so-called omatidia. Um, those are eyes where each little, each little segment of the eye, as revealed to the outside world, is a separately a separate photoreceptor. So it's like you have, instead of it being an eye like ours, where all the sort of light processing is happening centrally with the, going through the eye lens and so on, and then, the, then it's falling on this retina at the back of the eye. Instead, you have a different actual sort of piece of eye at all the different angles, and you put together lots of pieces of eye. And so what you see is this sort of, well, I don't know what you see because I'm, you know, I'm not a trilobite or an insect. So it's hard to get inside its brain, so to speak, to understand, quotes what it sees. Um, but uh, at least what comes to its brain is these much more discrete, much larger pixels. You know, we might have 10 million uh, pixels effectively in our physical scene, but um, uh, a, um, uh, you know, a, a housefly might have only, I don't know what it is, a few hundred pixels in its whole visual scene. So it's a much more granular, much much more uh, sort of uh, uh, discretized version of visual scene. And, and how it turns that, that sort of discretized version into what it sees is an interesting kind of uh, philosophical, psychological question. I mean, you can say, what is the effect of what it sees? And, you know, for example, if it sees some uh, thing that it's chasing, it'll see, oh, it went, it lit up that pixel, then that pixel, then that pixel, and it, and it has some way in its brain, you know, it only has 50,000 neurons or something, we have uh, about 100 billion, um, but uh, in its 50,000 neurons, it's um, uh, somewhere there is some little, little thing that's saying, oh, if you see this pixel light up, then this one, then this one, oh, that means something is moving, so go, you know, jump at it or jump away from it or whatever else. Um, but you know, getting an idea of of what the fly actually sees is is a is a question of of more philosophy and so on. Uh, sort of get how do you get inside another consciousness, so to speak, is a whole separate issue.
All right, let me see. Um, Okay, I noticed another question about visual, visual perception from Parker. When I close my eyes and apply pressure, um, I see colored dynamic geometric patterns. Why is this? You know, it's an interesting question and I have wondered about that. Um, it, uh, the, the basic reason I think is that you're putting physical pressure onto your optic nerve and that by pushing your eyes, you're increasing fluid pressure in your eyeball and that's, um, uh, that's uh, causing your optic nerve to have uh, to activate, so to speak, and it's sending signals down your optic nerve to your brain that is causing your brain to say, oh, you're seeing things. Now, I have to say, um, it's one of these things, I've been meaning to research this for 50-something for years, and I've never gotten around to it. But, but you know, when I do that, I'll typically see this, this grid of, of gray, and, gray and black squares, but the grid is somewhat distorted. It's not as if it's on a, on a perfect sphere. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a distorted grid, and, um, but not very distorted. And I don't know why there's this grid. I don't know why there's a, a grid of gray and black squares, and I don't think everybody sees the same thing. So, you know, the fact that it's so pixelated and rectangularly pixelated is just really weird to me. And, and I don't know why that happens. And I, and I have wondered whether the deformation is related to the sort of the deformation, you know, I wear glasses so you can tell that my vision isn't perfect, is the deformation of, um, uh, uh, of, of the of sort of light coming into my eyes. So, so, so typically, you know, what does one, uh, why does one wear glasses? Well, they're, they're usually it's because the optics of one's eyes isn't, isn't sort of perfect. And um, there are typically a couple of different things that happen. I mean, one is nearsightedness, longsightedness. Those are what happens there is the light coming from the outside world has to be has to be focused by your eye lens into a spot on your retina. And if the um, in the case where your 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 eye lens is not strong enough to focus, so something that's very close up. If you want to get the light from that to sort of reconverge and focus on a spot, your eye lens has to be really thickened up, and it has to be um, uh, it has to um, uh, be be deflecting the light so that you you focus it to a point, and so you can end up not being able to see things, not being able to focus things on things close up when your eye lens cannot be squashed enough to make it thick enough to deflect the light to get to your to, to focus on your retina. And uh, those of us who get more ancient, um, that's a, a, common, uh, a common phenomenon, is that the eye lens gets more harder to squash. So, so in the, the eye lens, it's kind of a clever setup. Um, the lens in your eye, uh, an ordinary lens made of glass, for example, it's a fixed lens. It has a certain thickness. It will uh, focus light to a certain amount. But your eye lens is, is made of sort of squishy stuff and it has, it has some muscles around it, the so-called ciliary muscles that are around it. And when you want to focus up close, those muscles squash the lens to make it thicker. And when you're focusing further away, those muscles relax and the lens is flatter. And so it's focusing light coming from further away. So when you get more ancient, um, that eye lens and the eye lens tends to get less flexible and the muscles I think get weaker. And so you're less able to, to squash that lens up to make it make it really thick. And so that means you, it becomes more and more difficult to focus on things that are close up. That, that's something that often happens with age. Then the other thing that can happen is when, when it's a question of seeing things from very far away, you can have uh, something where your eye lens is never quite sort of flat enough to do that, or your eyeball is, uh, is it too long or too short? I, I'd have to think about that. To, that the that the thing can focus light properly on your retina, and that's uh, that's if you are um, if you are nearsighted, that means that you can't focus on things further away, and you can put a corrective lens in your glasses that will successfully focus the light for you. Um, well, if if you're doing it uh, for nearsightedness, it will it will do more to bend the light. If you're doing it for for long, for, for, sorry, if you're doing it for, for things you can't see up close, um, you want to focus the light more, you want to have a sort of a, a thicker lens 
from things where you're dealing with things that you can't see far away. You want to have a lens that is a diverging lens um, that will uh, make the light focus sort of on your retina rather than kind of behind your retina where, where, where it, not, not, not successfully focused by the time it gets to your retina. So in any case, those are, those are the sort of uh, the, the most simplest and most common forms of, of, um, uh, of vision defects are they just the overall, um, uh, overall focusing of light. And, and that's a, a spherical correction because you can make it with a spherical lens, a lens that is, is sort of the same all the way around and it's just how thick is the lens um, and um, that's so, so if you look at an eye prescription, it'll say, you know, OD plus one or something. It's um, the D is it's Latin, dexter and sinister for right eye and left eye, um, OD and OS. And um, uh, the, um, um, uh, let's see, the, which way around is it? Those, those numbers are uh, numbers in diopters, which are a, a way of, of specifying the focal length of lenses. Um, or the or the magnifying power effectively of lenses, and so a typical kind of big correction, you know, like we really need, you know, you really need glasses is like three or four or something like that. Um, in the in the well, you should get glasses, but whatever, it's like one diopter or half a diopter or something of this kind. So the the most common type of of correction is these spherical corrections where you're where you're just looking at. Um, um, uh, well, it's just a question of whether the light focuses or not. The next level is so-called astigmatism, where the light, instead of the your eye behaving like an ordinary lens that's sort of so symmetrical all the way around, your eye behaves more like a cylindrical lens where it focuses light in one direction but doesn't focus it in the other direction. The most common cause of that is that the cornea of your eye is not uh, perfectly uniform in depth and instead has sort of bumps on it. And that, um, and that causes the light to be deflected as it comes into your eye. And so you get this astigmatism where the light is not focusing, where, where what was a point of light uh, uh, coming into your eye doesn't focus on a point on your retina, it focuses uh, on, but it isn't quite focused. It's more like a line, but it isn't, doesn't really focus at all. Um, and so that's, that's astigmatism and you can correct that by using a cylindrical lens. Um, and so you typically have a, a part of your, your correction that will be the spherical part, that's just the overall magnification. And then the cylindrical part, which is a magnification, but for something where the lens has is like a cylinder and it'll give the, the amount of the, the, the magnification and then the axis of the cylinder. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the next level of correction for, for eyes is, um, um, is this uh, uh, is that um, astigmatic correction, which is this uh, correction typically for sort of bumpiness on the cornea? And I know because I'm an obsessive data person, I I got some imaging done of my cornea, and you can kind of see the it isn't it isn't perfectly cylindrical or anything. It's it's just got bumpiness on it, um, and uh, that bumpiness is more or less corrected by using uh, glasses which have lenses that have this little cylindrical piece to them. Um, and uh, you know, if you do, for example, LASIK surgery, um, what you're doing there is you're kind of uh, peeling up, you're, you're, you're burning off uh, a few layers of, of, um, of cells on your cornea to try and flatten out typically um, what, uh, uh, what, what the cornea, which is the, the outer transparent outer coating of your eye, what, what that's like. Um, and by the way, if you really get obsessive, you can you can do higher order corrections to um, uh, in addition to spherical corrections, cylindrical corrections, you can do higher order corrections. And people sometimes think about that um, in doing LASIK surgery, for example. Um, and uh, if you're really obsessive, you can you can start imagining grinding glasses where you have these higher order corrections. It's not actually clear there are ways that the light can be deformed coming into your eye that are not correctable by lenses. I mean, you can get a good approximation, which is what actual glasses typically do, but you can't get it precisely right. And, and for those of us who are ancient, um, the a typical thing is because our eye lenses are not as flexible, it's, it's not as easy to go from focusing on something really close up to focusing on something really far away. Um, and so what tends to happen is there's this trick 
I think Benjamin Franklin is usually, uh, this trick is usually attributed to him, of, of bifocal glasses or now progressive glasses. Um, and so bifocal glasses used to have this trick that things in the upper part of the glasses would be suitable for looking at things far away and things in the lower part of the glasses would be lenses that were suitable for looking at things close up. Now, what's been done more recently is that glasses are progressive. So if I tip my head, I have progressed slightly progressive glasses at least. Um, and uh, so, you know, when I'm looking down, that's, um, uh, you know, the things I'm seeing, my glasses are optimized for seeing things. Well, for, uh, the top part is optimized for seeing things at a bit at a distance. The bottom part is optimized for things that I might sort of hold up to, uh, uh, you know, to read a book or, or something like that. Um, and it's optimized for a different distance. And there's a lot of sort of fanciness to figuring out how you make a progressive changing of lens. And, and typically that's done by changing the kind of plastic or whatever that is changing the amount that it, it, it refracts light um, from one part of the glasses to the other. That's the way that you have, uh, you make glasses that have that, that change. And there's a lot of other trickiness. For example, just the mathematics of where you have glasses that refract in this way versus that way, um, it's not easy to set that up correctly. And you end up having to deal with the, the issue that, that if you look, uh, there's, there's another parameter, which is how much to the side you look and how much the glasses correct on different sides. And different people have, when they read things, some people, when they read, they turn their head as they read from one side of a line to the other. And other people, move their eyes. And depending on whether you move your eyes or your head, that determines whether you're still looking through the same part of your glasses, or whether you're looking for a, through a different part of your glasses um, in, uh, when you're reading across that line of text. And so for example, if you're reading a newspaper, which has just columns of text, well, maybe nobody reads a newspaper in, in physical form anymore. I, I know I don't. Um, but uh, I read magazines in physical form, which have columns of text. Those columns of text are comparatively narrow. And so you're not gonna be you know, turning your head to a big angle as you move them. But if you have a book that has much wider text measure, then you might do that. And then it's a, it's a whole tricky optimization of glasses of how much you allow these sort of changing refractive index versus how much it changes as you look off axis in one direction or the other. Um, and that's that's a whole tricky thing about um, uh, so-called channel width, it's usually called. Um, I mean, I might say that, by the way, we we're talking about fonts and things like that. Um, there's a lot of trickiness in making things be easy to read. Uh, for example, if you have a long line of text, it's, it's usually quite hard to read across that. It's too wide. And that's why people tend to break it up into columns, because it makes it easier to read the text. And, and of course, there are different ways when you read, there are very different ways to read. I mean, there's some people where if you change the innards of a word, they'll barely notice and they'll still think it's the same word. I'm like that. Um, whereas there are others where it really matters, you know, it's sort of letter to letter to letter. And it's, it's reflected in people's ways of learning to read, this kind of sounding out things versus whole word reading and, and, and learning and so on. And I, and I think... There, there's pretty good evidence that the really the details of kind of the way fonts are formed and things like that has an effect on how people can sort of, in, you know, how quickly and how easily people can sort of recognize, oh, that's that word, that's that word, and so on. And, and for example, for people who are dyslexic, there's a whole other set of issues to do with uh, not sort of, uh, you know, flipping the letters around as you think about them and so on. And, and there seems to be some evidence that Things like the way these fonts work and so on can have an effect on the extent to which you can you can sort of get things and, and know what order they're in and such like. Oh boy, um, I've been yakking on about about eyes a lot. Um, uh, Richard is, is saying he sees this grid also. Um, I don't know why you see squares. I mean, this is such a crazy thing because there's nothing square about your eyes. Your eyes, if they have anything, the, the, um, the photoreceptors are in a hexagonal grid. So I just don't know where the squares come from. I, I really want to know that now. I'm, I'm, um, I, it's terrible that um, uh, I've literally been, been sort of meaning to figure that out in, for, since forever. I mean, one thing of this I did figure out when I was a kid 
which is if you take a black and white disc and you spin it, and you particularly if you have little trailing pieces of the black and white, and you know half black, half white disc, you spin the disc, you'll see you'll see color. Um, particularly if you have little sort of uh, tails of the black and white, you'll see rings of color around where those are. And I kind of had a theory when I was a kid for how that worked. It turns out my theory is more or less correct, I think. Um, and my theory was that the different uh, red, green, and blue color receptors in your eyes are kind of, uh, they have different rates at which they kind of recover from getting a red signal, getting a green signal, getting a blue signal, and so on. And that because they have different rates, when you spin this disc, your you know, the, the red one hasn't quite recovered, even though the blue one has by the time the disc comes around. And so that means you still see red, even though you're not seeing blue. And that mismatch causes you not to just see uh, sort of the gray from the combination of black and white. It causes you to see colors instead. And I think that theory is, turns out to be more or less correct. But at the same time, I was, I was probably 10 years old or something when I was trying to figure that out. And I was trying to figure out this, this um, gray and black squares. And I realized I don't think I've, uh, well, I should have figured it out in all that time, but I haven't. Um, okay, Aaron is commenting about, uh, asking about Fresnel lenses. Um, okay, I can, I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, and talking about VR headsets and their use of Fresnel lenses. Yeah, okay, so, so the, an ordinary lens works by, okay, so if you have, when light enters, glass, if you have a laser, some light goes into glass. If, it, if you have a slab of glass and the light is just going straight into the slab of glass, it'll just go straight through the slab of glass. Light goes more slowly in glass, about one and a half times more slowly than it does in air, um, but it'll just keep going straight through. If on the other hand, the light is coming at an angle, as it goes into the glass, because of that difference in speed, it's a little bit tricky to work out how this is. You can see it in terms of the wave fronts of the light that the thing will go closer to the axis than it was before. So it comes in at an angle and it goes, am I getting this the right way around? Yes, I'm getting it the right way around. And it goes, um, and it'll go more, more close to the axis. So if you, if you bring in light at an angle, it'll get tend to be at a less of an angle when it's inside the glass. Okay, so that effect is used to make ordinary lenses. And when you have a, a lens that's kind of bowing out you can, it means that when there are rays that are off the axis that are coming uh, into, that, into that lens, they'll be uh, refracted to be going uh, at an angle that's uh, at a different angle. So they might be coming in straight and then they then they're, uh, go at a different angle. And the fact that you have this lens that's, that's coming, uh, that's sort of uh, going tapering on both ends means that on both sides, both top and bottom, so to speak, means that it will focus light where there are parallel rays coming in, it will focus them to come down to a point. And, and similarly, if you have, instead of the lens being a converging lens, which bows out, you have it uh, sort of, you have it kind of, um, uh, have it not, not form something where it's bowing out in the middle, but bow out, bows out at the edges, then it will make the light rays diverge. Okay, so that's the ordinary way a lens works. Now, if you want to make a flat lens, let's say you want to make a lens that's just flat, then you can do that. The so-called Fresnel lens makes has a bunch of ridges. And those ridges each have, it's just another kind of way of arranging that when you sort of hit a ridge, then you'll have the same effect of the light um, converging or diverging. But instead of it being sort of the whole thing is set up in a in a um uh in this in this whole sort of uh uh you know, the whole lens works that way. You have it in, in a series of ridges um, on, on a flat sheet. And that's a, a convenient thing to do for all sorts of purposes when you make different kinds of things. And, and I guess um, uh, it was something that was used for lighthouses back in the day. And I'm trying to remember actually what the reason for it in lighthouses was. Um, I think those kinds of lenses, I mean, they're, they're very much more, you know, they're, they're more convenient. Like you can have a, a sheet of plastic that is a lens. I, I have many of these, which is a Fresnel lens where it's just a sheet of plastic. It's not something that kind of bows out in the middle. So that, that's sort of a convenient setup. Um, 
Okay, I think, uh, let's see, I think I have to go very soon here. Uh, maybe, let's see if there's one other question that, um, um, Uh, there's a question from Eddie about visual perception. I think we've been, a, we've been on a visual perception kick today um, about whether visual perception is discrete or continuous. I think I talked about that actually, maybe last time or the time before, about actually you know, seeing packets of light in our eyes. Um, the um, visual perception is, is um, I mean, we tend to make everything seem continuous, but it's an interesting question whether there are kind of optical illusions that uh, depend on the fact that ultimately we have discrete photoreceptors and so on. I mean, there are plenty of, uh, you know, what, what we tend to see in optical illusions is we tend to always extrapolate. Oh, even though this line wasn't there, enough of the rest of the line is there that we're just going to fill it in. So a typical version of this is if you cover one eye, um, and uh, let's see, we cover which way around would it be? That one, yes. Um, cover an eye, and um, you have a, a, some graph paper, just paper with a bunch of squares on it. And um, you put a big black dot on, on those squares. Okay. And you look at these squares, you cover one eye, and you focus on it different distances away then there'll come a point at which the black dot will simply disappear. And, and the reason that happens is because your eye, our eyes, um, have some, some many design defects, but one of them is that the optic nerve is, is uh, uh, um, it, the place in your eye where the optic nerve connects is a place where you don't have photoreceptors. And so it's a place where you can't see anything in that eye. Of course, you've got two eyes, so that part of your visual field is covered by the other eye. Um, but if you force yourself to be looking through one eye, then there'll be a there'll be a place, an angle at which there just aren't any photoreceptors, so you can't see anything at that angle from that eye. Now, if you're looking at this piece of graph paper, and you know you see this graph paper, and you're filling in, it's got you know it's got all these all these crisscross lines on it, and then that place where you actually can't see anything because where your optic nerve is and there are no photoreceptors, um, the black dot is right there. Well, you don't see the black dot. Isn't that incredibly weird? Because what's happening is your brain is saying, look, I know what's going on in this piece of paper. It's got a bunch of you know, vertical and horizontal lines. That's just what this piece of paper must be like. Let's just fill that in everywhere. Uh, you know, we don't know what, it, we don't know specifically from our eyes, what the piece of paper looks like in this position. But look, we'll just assume it goes on the way it was before. And that's what our brain perceives. Even though if you, you know, look at a different distance or you uncover your other eye, it's like, oh my gosh, there's a black dot there. But that is something which our brain does not perceive, yet our brain fills in things. It doesn't say missing data here. You know, we don't know what's here. Instead, it just interpolates what it sees elsewhere on the piece of paper and just fills it in. And so that's that's an example of one kind of optical illusion, but but there there are just an awful lot of them where where one is just sort of making assumptions. One's brain is kind of making assumptions based on sort of ambient things that are there. I'll give you one other example. It's another slightly tricky tricky one, which which I have certainly encountered a bunch of times, which is uh, what color something is, or what color something appears to be, depends on what other colors there are nearby. So, for example, our, our color vision system tends to sort of autocorrect for the ambient color. So, for example, if you say this thing is blue, okay, let's look at it under a different kind of light. Let's look at it under a much, you know, yellower light, like, like say an incandescent light bulb as compared to the sun. Those have very different, those are very different uh, uh, color spectrums. And so they, but it is a fact that, that we tend to still perceive oh, that looks blue, both in bright sunlight and under an incandescent lamp and in different settings with fluorescent lights and things like this, which, which according to, if we actually looked at the frequencies of light coming from that thing that we said was blue, they'd be very different in those different cases. But our eyes say it's blue in all those cases. And so what's happening is 
that we are correcting for the ambient color. We're looking at, oh, what are the colors of everything in the scene? Let's, let's know that that's the baseline. And let's say the thing we're actually looking at, that blue dot or whatever, um, you know, it is blue relative to everything else. It is very blue relative to everything else in the scene. Okay, so that, that leads to, so there's a lot of questions about how large scale that correction is. So for example, if you're looking at an image and you see on your computer screen, you see something where there's mostly yellow and there's a, a blue dot in the middle, or it's mostly red and there's the same color of blue in the middle, but it will not look the same. And, and, that's, um, and, and that happens on quite small scales in our visual field. And so for example, if you are making, you know, things I've often done of making uh, uh, pictures of the effects of simple programs like cellular automata, where you've got a bunch of different uh, uh, cells and there are maybe four or five different kinds of cells you say, oh, I'm going to represent those in different colors. One's red, one's green, one's whatever else. And you say, and then you look at these pictures and you're like, oh my gosh, there are not just four colors here. There are lots more colors. Why is that? Well, it's because of this color perception thing that something which was supposed to be just red on a different background looks a color other than red. So that, that's a tricky thing. And I, I wondered years ago whether it's possible to correct for that, whether it would be possible to sort of make it more red than it would otherwise be, and so that even though it had a blue around it, it would still seem the same red as the big block of red that didn't have blue around it. Uh, at the time, I didn't figure out how to do that. I'm not sure if it's possible. It may be that if you sort of make the colors more muted in general, you can still successfully do that. All right, I should uh, um, better get going here. Um, I have to go back to my day job. But thank you for those uh, interesting questions. And um, hey, somebody figure out that thing about the um, rubbing your eyes and, and, uh, and, and the grid of squares. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that would be very curious if, it, if, if it's squares, because we see so many squares in our environment. I don't think so, because I know I was seeing these things. Well, since I was a, a young kid, but I guess I'd already seen lots of squares in my environment by the time I was you know, five years old or something. Um, all right, we should wrap up here. Thanks very much and uh, see you next.